we got? Dismemberment. Carved up. Yeah, split from C to C. Yeah, C to C section. Huh. Kinda hard on the old constitution. This one didn't have a constitution for a long time. Had a thing called a confederation. Age? Less than a century and a half. We found this ID. Canada. What kind of a name's that? It means little village over there. Cut to pieces. Motive? Money, hate, infidelity, marital discord, history, geography. Looks like the work of professionals. Politicians? Yeah. See those wounds to its pride? Those are the results of party hacks. Yeah. I've seen it before. Chechnya, Yugoslavia. This one's different. No signs of recent violence. This might be hard to believe, but it looks like he was talked to death. This grisly dismemberment scene begs an obvious question. Why does Canada, of all nations, face the constant threat of separation? Hi, I'm Rick Green, and I have a, well, a theory. All those cop shows with the grisly killings share something with Canadian separatism. And I'm not just talking about Quebec separating. As we'll see, this nation's founding fathers fought an ongoing war with confounders and unfounders and folks fighting to found competing countries, which is somewhat contrary to our popular mythology. Canada. Created in 1867 with the Confederation of Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Ontario, and Quebec. Within a few years, British Columbia stretches its hands to its new family. Then, despite some dissent, Manitoba joins. Soon, beautiful Prince Edward Island allies herself to the mainland. In 1905, Alberta and Saskatchewan join. And finally, Newfoundlanders shout a resounding yes to Confederation. Bull. Canada's journey to nationhood has always been one endless dysfunctional family vacation from hell. <laughs> Shut up! Don't make me come back there! Go straight! Don't turn left! I'm in the driver's seat. I will decide where we're going. Share it. Give me some oil. Get your own. You guys are being like so uncool. I've got oil in my cereal. Regina. Mom, Manitoba said Regina. Fine. You don't like it, I leave. Fine, leave. Go ahead. If you want to leave, leave. See if I care. You wouldn't last five minutes on your own. Mom, New Brunswick's got more than me. Puff, I'm older. Give yeah. it. Get are we almost there yet? I'm getting seasick. You like that, huh? Yes. You want me to leave? Well, I wouldn't give you the pleasure. Shut up. No, you shut up. Okay, will you just relax? <laughs> I'm so out of here. I so don't need this. I'm going to learn Chinese and Japanese and make way better friends. There's no card. No, you shut up. Fermi la bush. Ah. Oh. <laughs> Mama Berta never gave me the transfer payments. Where are the First Nations? We had them in Meech Lake. Oh my God, we've left them behind. How could you forget the First Nations? Oh, 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 so I forgot them. Suddenly I am the one who's supposed to take care of them. <laughs> Shut up. Shut up. Nice, eh? Yes, history bites the separatists. A look at one nation, indivisible under God, but constantly on the verge of destruction by itself. Now, you folks who are not from the Great White North, you may have heard good things about Canada. Probably not from Canadians. We tend to be, I don't know, what's the word? Cynical. Smug. Whining. Ungrateful. Complaining. Passive. Narrow-minded. Boring. Stupid. Canada ranks second in the world in healthcare, third best in education, and just behind Scotland in curling rinks. Canada leads the world in donut shops, tundra, large nickels, cleanliness, and seal hunts. Then why are there separatists? If Canada is as good as it gets, why would anyone want out? With referendums, elections, and financial shenanigans, separation has always been a numbers game. And the number one reason to leave is we hate the government. 
Yeah, I know everybody hates their politicians, but Canadians were angry at their leaders before there was a Canada. Like back in the 1830s, when Quebec was still Lower Canada, here in Montreal, political activist Joseph Papineau spoke for many of his fellow French who were living under British rule. Here in Lower Canada, the government is not responsible to us, the French-Canadian people that it governs. What it is that we must fight for is a government not now, please. Is a government that understands what it is the people want. Will you please? Will you join the armed rebellion, my French Canadian friend? The time is now for action. Yes, we are. Oh. Excuse me, Mr. Papineau. If you're going to incite rebellion among the French Canadians, wouldn't you be better off doing it? In French? Oui. <laughs> you might assume these Lower Canada rebellions were the result of a French Catholic colony being run by English Protestants. Certainly people at the time did. But hey, there was just as much resentment up the St. Lawrence River in the very British colony of Upper Canada. For newspaper publisher William Lyon Mackenzie, it was an explosive issue, and he had a very short fuse. I'll tell you the problem with this country, laddie. It's that we're in Canada. But do you know where all the decisions are made? Across the sea in London? Across the sea in London, that's where. And you know who's making all those decisions? A bunch of milk-fed English fops. A bunch of milk-fed English fops, that's who. And you know what their problem is? They don't listen to us brick wall. They don't listen to us, that's what. It's like talking to a brick wall. But we've got a secret weapon up our sleeve. Something that's gonna change everything forever. Power of the newspaper to incite the anger of the masses. I'm gonna use the power of the newspapers to incite the anger of the masses. Ah, and there it is. The colonial advocate. The only paper that tells the truth about the secrets and the cover-ups. Okay? Political radicals like Papineau and Mackenzie fled to the United States with a price on their heads. When they returned, the federal government made them civil servants. Talk about punishment. Skip ahead through time to when Canada is again threatened by angry French Canadians fed up with the federal government. It all takes place, of course, in the province of Manitoba. That's right, Manitoba. The Northwest Rebellion featured some of the most important battles ever fought on Canadian soil. Unfortunately, we don't have the budget to recreate them, but we do have the next best thing. And now, the Louis Riel story. <laughs> My people, yeah? we are the Métis, half French, half native. <laughs> we are proud of ourselves and our land. Yeah. But an influx of settlers from the east are settling where we settle and destroying our culture. Oh, wow. We must stop this genocide in the only way we can, <laughs> by rebellion. <Yeah. laughs> but Louis, our prisoner, Thomas Scott, refuses to recognize your authority. That's right. Curse you, Louis Riel, with your native French-speaking Catholic ways. Ooh. Oh, Thomas Scott, I sentence you to die. No, yes. <gasps> pew, pew. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but Louis, that's going to cause trouble. You'd better escape for a while. Yes, you're right. I'll flee to the United States, but not for long. Let's go! Meanwhile, in Ottawa... Prime Minister MacDonald, there is a rebellion in the West. We must take urgent action, but how can we get the troops there in time? Oh, I have a secret weapon. Feast your eyes on this magnificent train, loaded with soldiers. Oh, yes. oh, oh. War is hell. This would not be the last time that French-speaking separatists resorted to violence. We now come to the 1960s and the FLQ. It's a yoke. A yoke, that is what they put on the cattle to pull the plow. Where is everyone? 
Has our cell been penetrated by the police? Our uh, comrades detained? Hey, it's the playoff. Oh, yeah, play neck. All right. All rise for the singing of the new national anthem. <clears throat> oh, Quebec, a worker's paradise. True radicals and raving Trotskyites. With immune hearts we see the rise of Gulag Labrador and stand on guard, oh chair. Lots of cheese for. <sighs> Unlike Louis Riel, the Front de Libération du Québec was not really leading a popular uprising. These rebels without a chance spread random terror. Consequently, they had about as much support here in Quebec as the Conservatives under Kim Campbell. But a boom! <laughs> But they had a dream, a vision, to replace Canada's monstrous confederation with a Quebec communist utopia. I don't get a sense they had a real clear idea of how that was going to unfold exactly, since at one point they actually discussed blowing up the Statue of Liberty. It is time to strike a blow for communist Quebec. We will free the people from state and church by destroying a hollow metal symbol of the government's reckless abandon. <laughs> the Statue of Liberty! Yeah! Yes, comrade. Comrade Antoine, uh, the Statue of Liberty, she is in the United States, not in Canada. Of course, but she can still be a symbol for all that oppresses us French. Oh, fantastic, Antoine. Yes. E except that that statue there, uh, she was created by the French and, and is a part of French culture. She's French? But... With a long skirt? <laughs> what is it, Comrade Jacques? All right, if we are the front, De Liberation du Québec. Shouldn't we be called the FDLDQ? Did you know that stupidity is counter revolutionary? We will destroy another hollow metal symbol of the federal government's incompetence. Mailboxes. Mailboxes! After a few hundred explosions, scores of injured bystanders, and six deaths, the FLQ finally realized bombing things wasn't winning them popular support. In rejecting random violence, the FLQ were years ahead of the PLO, the IRA, and the NHL. Comrades, if we continue hurting people in this way, we will lose our popular support. What popular support? <laughs> My mom will not let us have meetings in the basement anymore. Aww. We must stop this cowardly, craven, faceless act and come up with a new cowardly, craven, faceless act. What? No more random violence, more specific violence. Namely, kidnapping and murder. Yes. Yes. The FLQ plotters eventually got their wish to live in a communist utopia, and they ended up having to flee to Cuba. Believe it or not, a few years later, they returned to Canada, did some jail time, and then some of them got government jobs with the same government that they tried to bring down. They became civil servants, shades of Papineau and Mackenzie. But the FLQ were finally brought to heel by another Quebecer who was determined to rein in the hotheads and to stop the violence. Actually, there were two of them working together by working against each other, Pierre Trudeau and his arch nemesis, René Lévesque. Ah, Trudeau, let me show you some of the new equipment we've given you. Naturally, you've been issued with the latest wristwatch communication device. Yes, should be handy for keeping track of all the girls. It has not been perfected out of years of patient research entirely for that purpose. Now, you see that red button there? This one here. Whatever you do, don't touch it. 
It activates the War Measures Act, sending soldiers and tanks into the cities here, here, and here. Soldiers and tanks, you're joking. I never joke about my work, Double Trudeau. Give me Barbara. The SLQ have kidnapped people and the future of Canada is at risk. Oh, misty water-colored map. It's all right. I have everything under control. I'm going to invoke marital law. You mean martial law. I know what I mean. Well, nicotine finger, I think you made your point about the French language laws. Uh, I thank you and merci for the demonstration. Choose your next bilingualism carefully, Mr. Trudeau. It could be your last. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Trudeau. I expect you to separate. How far will you go? Just watch me. How far will you go has always been a key question here in Canada. In fact, as we'll see, having to go far has been a key reason for wanting to go. In this day and age, with transcontinental highways, it's hard to imagine just how much of a challenge Canada's size was to Confederation. It's a numbers thing. The distances are huge. Reason number two to separate, that long distance feeling. The people of Ontario and Quebec deserve better. The government has moved its capital city from Kingston to Montreal. Then it was moved to Toronto, and then to Quebec City, and then back again 800 miles to Toronto here. Are we so insecure as a nation that we can't even decide and make up our minds where to have our capital? Well? They moved it back to Quebec City. Oh. <laughs> No, wait, it was Kingston. Canada's capital was finally moved to Ottawa in 1866, making it equally inaccessible from Ontario and Quebec. But what if you're not hundreds, but thousands of miles from your capital city? You see, British Columbia was thinking of joining Confederation, but Vancouver was over 2,000 miles from Ottawa. Well, hello, young lady. I'm on my way east to Ottawa. A train ticket east is 37 cents. Well, isn't that marvelous? 37 cents. You know, that's less than a day's pay. Although, I didn't know that the train went all the way to Ottawa. Oh, this doesn't run to Ottawa. It runs towards Ottawa. This will get you to the capital. Uh, uh, Fort Langley. Fort Langley. From there, you'll have to take a boat upriver. Would you like a ticket? Uh, and, and what's the boat fare? 37 cents. Uh, really? All right, fine. And that will get me all the way to Ottawa, will it? No. This will get you to the gold mining town of Barkerville. From there, you'll need a stagecoach ticket. It's 37 cents. Oh, fine, but that will get me to Ottawa. <laughs> no. Banff. Then you'll have to take a barge to Calgary for 37 cents. Uh, from there, you'll have to take a wagon to Fort Regina. That costs 37 cents. Then beaver traders will canoe you to Winnipeg for 37 cents. From there, 37 cents will get you a steamer down the Red River. Uh, then you'll have to take a wagon to Sault Ste. Marie. From there, a lake boat will deliver you to Windsor for 37 cents. And then you'll have to take a train to Toronto, and that will cost you 37 cents. And then? And then you take a steamer to Kingston. Uh, that costs 37 cents. And then you'll have to transfer and take another train to Ottawa. 37 cents. Oh. Would you like travel health insurance? Uh, yes, I'd better. Indian attack insurance? Uh, why not? Yes, please. Baggage insurance? Certainly. Starvation insurance? Absolutely. Rebellion insurance? Why not? Scurvy insurance? Sure. So the idea of trying to govern British Columbia from Ottawa is like trying to run Egypt from London, England. Actually, at about this time, the British were trying to run Egypt from England, and it wasn't working all that well for them. In return for joining Confederation, BC wanted regular steamboat service to the east. The politicians took a chance and asked for a road. To their shock, Ottawa offered them a Trans-Canada Railway. Which brings us to the third reason to go. Cha-ching! Yes, in the numbers game, money still buys support, and lack of money still costs you an election. In fact, you could argue, at the center of all of the reasons to leave Canada, there's money. I don't get it. How come the Eastern politicians 
tax us honest Albertans and cut into our profits of beef, oil, and lumber. Them government regulations are killing us. Ottawa needs to smarten up and cut us some slack. We'll let the market decide. Well, we got the beef, the oil, the lumber. Well, how can we got to pay for the rest of the country? Well, we should leave. Hey, Roy, the price of oil just tanked. The border to the U.S. is closed because of another mad cow, and the Americans are appealing the softwood lumber thing again. Okay. I don't get it. How come them Eastern politicians don't smarten up and put in some regulations that protect us from the craziness of the free market? Another thing I don't get is why I got this Texas accent. Yeah, me too. Are right, you folks back east don't know nothing. In the 1970s and 1980s, when Quebec was awash in talk of leaving Confederation, corporations were leaving Quebec at an astonishing rate. Language laws and concerns for the future turned Montreal into a ghost town. Business doesn't like instability. If money has been one of the biggest reasons to go, it's also been one of the biggest reasons to join. John A. Macdonald and his cohorts were determined to create a Confederation of Canada. Money was lavished on conferences, expensive dinners, elegant balls. Money flowed freely to politicians who supported the coming Federation. When resistance arose, better terms were offered, which meant more money. Politicians pointed out that Confederation would make economic sense and more money. And so on July 1st, 1867, four provinces, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Ontario, and Quebec were joined together. And then within weeks, before the ink was dry on the bribe money, the first separatist government was elected in Nova Scotia. Coming to the silver screen, it's the story of one man's search for justice and a fair deal. It's Don't Ask Me How, the Joseph Howe story. My fellow Nova Scotians, I have always fought for the responsible government. I have never been an advocate for violence, unlike Papineau and, 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 and Mackenzie, who, who she, she shall remain nameless. When I first heard talk of this confederation, I, I, I went straight to London. And I asked them to stop it. But they didn't. This, this, this confounded confederation is, 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 is irresponsible government. And I will go straight to Ottawa and fight it. I'll go to Ottawa and I'll speak my mind. And see Howe's triumphant crusade to Ottawa. Blue in the face and I won't buckle. Even if McDonald offers to buy me out with better terms or more money. Now off with you, driver. 37 cents. 37 cents? <laughs> Forget it. I'll walk. See how's awkward return from Ottawa. I have returned. Yeah, I, I, I would have been here sooner, but the man wanted 37 cents. <laughs> McDonald tried to buy me off with uh, 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 bitter terms and more money. But I said no. <laughs> The, 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 the wily rascals uh, tr tried to offer me better terms and more money and, and, and a cabinet post. Then I said yes. <laughs> See how's profitable return to Ottawa and a high paying job. Coming up, as Nova Scotia fumes, Prince Edward Island makes a request. Show me the money. Over the years, union with the United States has been pushed by many commercial interests. But first, a commercial. As we've seen, Nova Scotians were furious, claiming they had been railroaded into joining. And there's some truth to it. BC joined in 1871 on the promise of being railroaded. And Prince Edward Island? They railroaded Canada. You can keep your money, Mr. McDonald, sir. What, oh, Cecia? You're turning down my offer to buy the island, but, but why? Oh, I'm sure back in your big city of Kingston you have fine buildings and fancy clothes, but here on Prince Edward Island we have something that means more to us. A little something I call love. I, I've been so busy thinking all the changes I could make here, I, I lost sight of 
all the things that should stay just as they are. Oh, Mr. McDonald! What a foolish old man I've been to think I could buy your island with this. That's right! We want at least double. What? Okay, let's get down to brass tacks here. We want enough to pay off the railway debt and enough to pay out those absentee landlords. I hate those wankers. And enough extra to make it interesting. Why, you And genius. if we don't get it, we're joining the States. How's them apples? Okay, that isn't exactly how it went down, but you get the idea. It was kind of a Mexican standoff because they both needed each other. PEI got some debt relief and got its railway out of hawk, and Canada avoided having an American state in its midst. Which brings us to our fourth reason to leave. Reason number four to separate, to join the USA. The idea of Canada, or even parts of Canada, joining the United States has been around forever. In the early 19th century, one of the strongest movements for American annexation came from, of all places, Quebec. Joseph Papineau had fled to the United States after the Lower Canada Rebellion went, and he liked it down there. I am back! Okay! I have brought something back from the United States that I know you will have never seen before. Eh? <laughs> yes, slides of my vacation. Okay, good. Yes, one of the greatest things of the United States is that they have freedom. In most parts of the United States, you are free to practice slavery. Now, also, yes, in most parts of the United States, you can also carry a gun. <laughs> and a lot of people do. <laughs> now, they don't have the same problem that we do with the, our natives here, yes? Because, well, they don't really have many natives left. So, that's good. Actually, a more logical choice for which colony would join the States was British Columbia. And this also covers you for Buffalo Stampede. Oh, God forbid. You know, when I get to Ottawa, I'm going to demand that they pay for a safer, faster, cheaper route from here to there. I mean, before we even consider joining this country. Oh, you want faster, cheaper, and safer? Why didn't you say so? Here. Take a steamer ship down to San Francisco. Then catch the Union Pacific across to Washington. Then train up north to Canada again. Really? Hmm, um, book me as far as Washington. I've got some people to talk to there, and then I'll consider whether I want to go to Canada. That'll be 37 cents. Ah. 37 cents U.S. And Newfoundland might have joined the United States. By 1949, there was a huge American presence on the rock, and it was nuclear. The Strategic Air Command. Americans were developing a paranoid fear of communism. Newfoundlanders already had decades of fear of confederation. Why? Newfoundland is actually closer to Ireland than it is to Saskatchewan. Newfoundlanders saw how the Irish Catholic, under English Protestant rule, suffered from grinding poverty and endless violence. Newfoundlanders, who were mostly Irish Catholic, already had the grinding poverty, but that violence kind of worried them. Confederation is a numbers game. And in 1949, Newfoundland voted to join by a slim majority, 52% to 48%, about the same numbers as the Quebec referendum of 1995. Ah, uh, yes, Quebec. I know you were thinking this whole hour was going to be about Quebec, and it could have been, even after 140 years as the keystone of Canada, the number one fear Quebecers share and their number one reason for wanting sovereignty remains. We are afraid our culture will be absorbed or repressed by you, arrogant Anglophones. Reason number five to separate, fear of losing your cultural identity. You outnumber us. You have more power, more money. You might overwhelm us. To which most English-speaking Canadians or Anglophones would answer, Huh? Nonsense! To fear us just because we outnumber you? That's ridiculous! What have we ever done to you? I mean, recently, on purpose, seriously! It, to hate someone just because of what they might do to you or because what they've done to you in the past, that's stupid. And yet, take those same English-speaking Canadians and ask them about Americans, and... We have to protect ourselves. Our Canadian culture might be overwhelmed or absorbed by you arrogant Americans, because you got more people than us. 
You got more, more money than us. You got more power. You guys, you guys can destroy us. Bull puppies. That's ridiculous to fear us just because we outnumber you. What'd we ever do wrong to you? Besides the War of 1812 <laughs> and Paris Hilton. <laughs> Tell you who the real threat is, my friend. Them Chinese. They have numbers. They could overwhelm us. Help! No! Wild, eh? Francophones and Anglophones fear the exact same thing. It's just the Francophones actually fear the Anglophones, whereas the Anglophones fear the Americaphones. Of all the driving forces for separatism, we'll see that losing your culture is certainly the strongest and the most insidious. Why? Because it's completely emotional. Help! How do you argue against emotion? Well, I don't think you should do that. Well, I feel I should. Well, I don't think your feelings matter. Well, I think my feelings do matter. In fact, I feel my feelings matter. Well, I don't think, stick to the fact. Well, the fact is, this is what I feel. Well, it's wrong. No, I'm sure that's what I feel. No, I need to try and to feel that. We are afraid our culture will be absorbed or repressed by you arrogant anglophones. After 140 years of confederation, most English-speaking Canadians think they know Quebec's fears. And why am I not speaking in French. There are other factors at work here that many Canadians may not understand, but which are bred in the bones of Quebecers. For example, many Canadians may assume there's a strong bond amongst Quebecers for Mother France. Your Majesty. Yes, what is it? I need to talk to you about the affairs of state. Oh, goody, send her in. No, 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 Your Majesty. I'm talking about our finances. Oh, I'm busy. The, the Duke of Burgundy sent me these drums for my orchestra, so... Our coffers are running low. We need to make some cuts. We simply cannot afford to maintain the imperial holdings. Running colonies is expensive and we, we have to lose one. Now, do you want to keep cold tree-covered Quebec that is snowy and ice-bound with its bear and porcupine and skunk and angry natives and cloud of bloodthirsty mosquito? Or do you want to keep Sunny, warm, tropical, breezy Guadeloupe with its nice coconut, ripe pineapple, and native women who lie on the beach, topless. Oh, mon dieu! Nice coconut, huh? Oh. Tell Quebec good luck, but uh, tell Guadeloupe I'll be on the next ship, eh? <laughs> It wasn't that Quebec was simply conquered by the British, it was also abandoned by France. And this abdication has created a deep subconscious hurt in the Quebec psyche. Now, before the rest of Canada promises, oh, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, we'll respect Quebec's culture, consider our record. Back when Quebec was still Lower Canada, the French and English colonists got along fairly well, until about 1810. That's when the British governor, Sir James Henry Craig, overreacted something he was apparently prone to do. Apparently, over in France, this Napoleon Bonaparte fellow is again plotting to rule the world. And a few of the French chaps here are saying they want a fair shake. And by fair shake, they probably mean they want to rule the world. Quick, arrest all those Frenchies, shut down their assembly, and shut down their newspaper. Craig's overreaction provoked anger, ill will, and suspicion. French-English relations deteriorated. So Britain sent young Lord Durham to investigate. It is my recommendation that English and French Canada be combined into one big region. They must be unified, yes? At some point, of course, the French must be outnumbered. How? By outbreeding the French. The English can save this country, and so we, we must make babies. Forget it. But it's a patriotic act. Nice try. It's to save your country. Oh. And very well, then close your eyes and think of England. Get bent. 
Canada was created so the English could assimilate the French. It might be news to you, but it has not been forgotten around here. Over the years, various Quebec governments have taken many steps to try and increase the population, such as baby bonuses. Hard to believe that French would need to be paid to make love, but... Today, Quebec has one of the lowest birth rates in the country. Since the separatists couldn't win that numbers game, they tried a different game, voting themselves off the island. Previously on Survivor Canada. In the opening episode, 1980, the 10 premiers met and divided up into two tribes. The Canucks numbered nine. The separatist tribe was Quebec. I decided to issue the first challenge. I held a referendum. I figured I would win hands down. What could the others do? But the Canuck tribe brought back their hot player, Pierre. The referendum was defeated. The Canuck tribe victorious. Then in the second episode, 1981. Okay, your tribal challenge is to be the first to get the Constitution. It's still over in England. Come on. Well, uh, we had to go get it, so uh, I drew up a plan. We're going to have a charter of rights. And, and freedoms. Yeah, rights and freedoms. And an amending formula. I saw what he'd drawn up, and I hated it. I wanted recognition that Quebec was distinct and more veto power. Pierre was a man with a plan. I needed to pull everyone together, so I uh, took it to tribal council. And the Supreme Court sided with me. I still didn't like it. We tried to uh, drag Rene along with us, but uh, we didn't have the pull. Quebec was unhappy, wanting recognition for its uniquely special uniqueness and more veto power. To break the tie... I did an end run, and I got the Queen to sign it without Quebec. Rene felt he had been betrayed. I had been betrayed! But his failure to unite the tribe led to Pierre himself being voted off. I wasn't voted off. I took a walk in the snow and uh, decided to go. And Team Quebec switched Rene for Robert. Okay, just beyond that clearing is Meech Lake. The tribe must find a way to work together to get across that lake. The winner of that challenge will win immunity, power, a distinct society, and the notwithstanding clause. This is Brian. He'll be leading the way. Well, we are going to do it this time. We're going to make sure we don't leave anybody behind this time. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, uh, we uh, got to Meech Lake, but uh, it all got blocked. Everybody is arguing and arguing, arguing. It was a mess. Had they learned nothing about survival? I'm going to play the referendum card. Again? You already lost that challenge. I remember the 1995 referendum and it was as big a crisis for Canada and Canadians as, well, the 72 hockey series against the Russians. Coming up, he votes, he scores! If you add up the goals scored in the famous 1972 hockey series, the Russians actually outscored Canada 52% to 48%. But we won more games and that's what mattered. In the 1995 referendum, Canada outscored the separatists by a score of 51% to 49%. This whole referendum thing has been a disgrace, eh? Remember back in 72 when we thought we could beat them Russians real easy? Hey, we were thinking, this is our game, right? There's no way we're gonna lose to a bunch of drab, no-name products of some left-wing party system. And then what do you know, huh? Bam, that separatist team comes in. Oh, sorry. Sovereignty Association team. Anyway, these Francophobes, they decide to switch things up, eh? Yeah, they bring some new guy in. He sets the place on fire. They start landing one hit after another, and they start taking it to us, beating us at our own game, namely, building a nation. I tell you, they come into our ranks and take it to us, just like them Russians did. Yeah, but then they started making mistakes, eh? Offending the voters, showing their true colors. And that's when our boys woke up. They started showing heart. They got right in their face. And we won that game. One key factor was a fairly spontaneous last minute rally in Montreal by English speaking Canadians. We love you, Quebec. My Canada includes Quebec, bonjour, as well as all of the French speaking parts of Manitoba and New Brunswick. And we don't want you to go because 
we don't want you to go. Yes. If you leave, where will people in Ottawa go if we want to get a drink after one in the morning? And what are we going to call the Montreal Canadiens if you go? The Habs. Oh, yeah. My Canada includes you, and it also includes Florida because half of the people there are from Quebec. <laughs> yeah. If you go, we're going to have to elect a prime minister from another province. And remember what happened with Joe Clark and Kim Campbell and John Turner? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Please don't make us go through that again. If you leave, where are we going to get all our hockey goalies from? Yeah. 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 And, our, and our strippers. Yeah. Hey! Yeah. I like poutine. I, I don't know what it is, but I like saying it. Poutine. Yeah. Shouldn't we be saying this in French? And then some Canadians began to ask a rather awkward question. Exactly which part of Canada is separating from which part of Canada? Is the entire province of Quebec going? If Quebec is separating from Confederation, shouldn't it be along the borders as they were at Confederation back in 1867, the old Canada East boundaries? And what about the parts of Quebec where there's an English-speaking majority? Can they stay in Canada? I mean, if you can divide up a country, why not a province? And could the English-speaking neighborhood of Westmount secede from the city of Montreal? Or what if the Robert family decides to go, but their next door neighbor, the Wilsons, decide to stay in Canada? Will their kids need passports to play together? And finally, not all of this land is legally Quebec's. As the native people made quite clear, they were happy right where they were, in Canada. The separatists lost the 1995 referendum at the voting booths. One big reason? A simple proposal had twisted itself into a complex question. To uh, give me the approval to pursue the right to ask the question as to whether or not a union could be formed uh, uh, that would allow for negotiations to happen at some time in the future that would lead us to a new arrangement, uh, a new position, one that is uh, advantageous and uh, mutually satisfying. Forget it! Uh, just get into bed with us then and uh, we can talk more then. <laughs> Is it? Get bent. Uh, After barely winning the 1995 referendum, Prime Minister Jean Chrétien unleashed his secret weapon, bureaucracy. <sighs> Thank you very much for that eloquent presentation. That was the uh, separatist argument. And now with the, uh, the federalist point of view, Mr. Stéphane Dion. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to begin... Uh, no relation to, uh, Celine? Hmm? Stéphane Dion. Celine Dion. Any relation? Oh, no, uh, no, Your Honor. I'd like to begin... Because, you know what? You look a little bit like her. Especially right around the eyes. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, uh, we are not, uh, related. I'd like to begin by... Oh, oh, oh <laughs> you know... <laughs> Wait, when you do that little, um, that little frowny thing, looks just like Celine. I can assure you, Your Honor, I am not related to or have no connection to Celine Dion. <clears throat> I'd like to begin by singing a little number I call Clarity. Uh-oh, where am I going with this? Before you talk succession, I need to see the question. You cannot break the nation without negotiation. Don't sit there on the fences. We got to have consensus. Can't have no referendum without a small addendum. So listen when I tell you we need some clarity. Yeah, everybody now. So listen when I tell you we need some clarity. The result was Bill C-20, a.k.a. the Clarity Bill. Oh, 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 hey, hey, yeah. Canada became the only nation in the world with a set of rules on how to commit suicide. How Canadian. Here's one final irony in an issue laced with paradoxes. The 1995 referendum, which at the time felt like the last straw for Canada, was actually a kind of last gasp for separatism. For 36 of the last 40 years, our Prime Minister has been from Quebec. Today, pleasing Quebec has become such a non-issue, Canadians have actually felt confident enough to elect a Prime Minister from Ontario. And you could argue there's been another payoff for Quebec's playing the numbers game. As the Gomery Report has shown, millions of dollars have flowed from Ottawa to Quebec. 
I used to worry about separatism until the day after the 1995 referendum. You know, the squeaker. On the news, I heard a Quebecer say... My only regret is that the vote wasn't even closer to really scare them and send a message to the rest of Canada. Not 50% plus one, 50% minus one. To really scare them. I told you, this is a numbers game. To really scare them and send a message to the rest of Canada. Send a message to the rest of Canada. Send a message to the rest of Canada. It's going to be hard to pinpoint time death. It's gone cold. Looks like all the life blood's been drained out of it. It moved. They're still laughing at it. It's not dead. It's coming back to life. It's a fighting back. You stupid country. Humans crave drama. And when we have no real drama, we make some up. After all, only a safe society could sit around amusing itself by watching television shows about gruesome murders. As someone once pointed out, in Africa, they don't have horror movies. They don't need them. We have a safe, secure, boring country. So I'm thinking we can relax. After all, as we've seen, every part of Canada has threatened to leave at some point, and hey, everyone's still here because, after all, this is the best country in the world. Yes, Canada. Over 4 million square miles and 24 million citizens. It's over 33 million now. This film is old. A nation blessed with vast, endless stocks of fish. Obviously, this was made before all the cod were completely fished out. Canada's healthcare system is the best in the world, with no waiting times. A nation free of epidemics. Uh, clearly, this was before SARS and the mad cow and the bird flu, but still. But her cities are equally robust, with amazing structures, such as the soon-to-be-completed <laughs> Olympic Stadium. <laughs> Let, let's just speed this up here and get to the good stuff. And great sports teams, such as the Winnipeg Jets, the <laughs> Quebec Nordiques, um, the Ottawa Rough Riders. I give up. Hey, wait a second. You, you didn't talk about the impact of Stefan Dion as head of the Liberals and, and the impact of Stephen Harper recognizing Quebec as a distinct society. And, and hey, wh what about the latest poll that shows support for sovereignty? I mean, Have you not uh, been listening for the last hour? That's how Canada works. Controversy, drama, it's normal. Relax. Oh, well.